It was 75 years ago that Soviet troops moved into the Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp in Poland to liberate the remaining prisoners there. More than a million people, most of them Jews, were killed there, victims of execution, the camp's gas chambers, or from starvation, cold and disease. And today, on International Holocaust Memorial Day, world leaders will visit Auschwitz for memorial events. Jenny Hill has been to meet some of those survivors who will be attending the events. What they endured is difficult to describe, harder still to imagine. The survivors of Auschwitz, preparing last night to commemorate the anniversary of its liberation. I heard their crying and screaming, and those screams go with me all the way to this day. It's 75 years since Russian soldiers flung open the gates of Auschwitz and the world recoiled in horror. The Nazis killed more than a million people here, many systematically gassed to death in purpose-built chambers as part of a plan to wipe out Europe's Jewish population. Those who survived had been starved, terrorized, tortured. I was nine years old when I was liberated. Miriam, just a child at the time, a victim of the camp's notoriously sadistic doctor, Josef Mengele. So I was with the children that Mengele was killing, and, and he did exper experience on me too, experiments. But I was just lucky, I lived. And then, an important reunion. I know. <laughs> this is Miriam. Like right here, and I'm right on the top. <laughs> Today, they'll tell their tales again. In a new age of rising anti-Semitism, they hope their voices carry. And Jenny is in Auschwitz now for us. Uh, Jenny, you are there observing these events. How has the day unfolded so far? Very gently. Um, it's very much all about the survivors. There are about 200 of them here as part of the commemorations today. A little earlier, we watched several of those survivors coming forward to gather at what they call here the Wall of Death. It's just around the corner um, from where I'm standing. And it's a part of the camp where prisoners would be lined up and executed, a very dark place for those survivors to stand. Um, many of them, as you can imagine, find it very difficult to come back to the camp, to retrace their steps, and even to talk about what happened to them. But they do it, as you saw in the report there, because they believe it's very important to try to ensure that the world doesn't forget what happened here. And it's, of course, not just the survivors who are attending there, and obviously a deeply difficult day for them, but also global politicians. What are we hearing from them? What are we expecting to hear from them later in the day? You're right, there are heads of state and representatives from countries around the world who'll gather here later um, for speeches. And I think that they're likely to focus very much on the increasing alarm um, about uh, anti-Semitism starting to rise. Um, we're hearing from Jewish communities all over the world that that is the case. There are also concerns that recent research shows that perhaps the public knowledge and awareness of the Holocaust is starting to diminish somewhat. So I, can, I would expect that we would start to hear from world leaders is trying to address those subjects. We know, for example, that the Dutch Prime Minister just yesterday apologized on behalf of his country to Dutch Jews for not standing by, not doing more for them um, during the Holocaust. And I expect we'll hear more of that um, kind of thing as the day goes on here. Okay, Jenny, thank you for your insights. And of course, uh, there's plenty more on uh, this story and what is happening today on our website, BBC News Online. It was 75 years ago that Soviet troops moved into the Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp in Poland to liberate the remaining prisoners there. More than a million people, most of them Jews, were killed there, victims of execution, the camp's gas chambers, or from starvation, cold and disease. And today, this is the scene at Auschwitz on International Holocaust Memorial Day, where survivors, family of those killed and world leaders are attending a memorial. We'll have full coverage when that ceremony gets underway. 
Well, for many of the survivors, there was no family or home to return to. It was a desperate situation, particularly for children. 300 were given a chance to start rebuilding their shattered lives in England on the shores of Lake Windermere. Jane McCubbin went to meet one of those. And it's an amazing story that some viewers may find upsetting. Eric lost everybody. Everybody. My f mother, my father, brother, sisters. There was a long time when you just couldn't talk. No. About any of this. For many, many years. For about 30 years, I had terrible nightmares. As a child, Eric was sent to Auschwitz straight from the orphanage, arriving in a queue before an officer to survive. He'd lied about his age and his abilities. He sent me to the right side, and uh, only three out of 183 children, we got to the right side. The others were all killed that day. I used to bury the bodies. And you were how old? Eleven and a half. But Eric Hirsch's story of survival as the Germans retreated is as astounding as the brutality he witnessed. This is uh, the train to Czechoslovakia. And it was captured in a few treasured photographs. We've been a whole month on this train. We buried most of the people on the journey. The pictures chronicle his journey from Germany to Czechoslovakia where the war ended. This is in Prague on the day actually when we took the aeroplane. And finally on to refuge in the UK. We're walking to the aeroplanes. Wow. Yeah. No idea what, what it would be like. Or but knowing what, what you were leaving behind. Yes. Yes. We're told we're going to England. We just hope that everything will be okay. Out of the darkness of war, this is where he arrived, one of 300 children finally safe. It was summertime and the sun was shining, it was wonderful, lakes, uh, walk down to the lakes for a swim and it was wonderful. Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Eric was one of the Windermere children, housed on the banks of the shore in chalets which were once a factory and is today a school. There was uh, just single rooms and all the way down there were properties they uh, were making aeroplanes during the war right so they all went home and we took the houses we went to picture house we paid sixpence to see a film and then girls and boys came with bicycles and, and lent us the bicycles here they were given shelter, food, clothing, English lessons, friendship. Six short months, but an introduction to a new life worth living. Eric settled in Manchester where he married and started a family. And today, with an OBE, he visits schools to keep their story alive. After all you'd seen, did any of this restore your faith in humanity? Yes. But humanity has learned, there's still wars, there's still fighting. And um, I hope the world will be a more peaceful in my time. And that's why you do what you do. That's right. Well, with me is World War II historian, Dr. Helen Fry. Thanks for coming in, uh, Dr. Fry. Just explain to us the significance of this day and just how valuable a ceremony like this is. It's International Holocaust Memorial Day, so it's, it's commemorated throughout the world. Highly significant because, of course, Auschwitz came to symbolise the murder of six million Jews and five million others in the Holocaust. And just explain to us just how important it is to have a day like this. It's all about remembrance and a reality check to see where we are. And of course, one of the big themes in the last week has been the rise of anti-Semitism again. We're just seeing pictures now of those ceremonies getting underway, those commemoration events taking place in the south of Poland. We obviously know that politicians are there, but also survivors. And Dr. Mm. Bright, it must be hugely difficult for these individuals to return to Auschwitz. 
I don't think we should underestimate the courage it takes to go back to that horrendous place of suffering. They've got the memories they're living with, they've got the loss of whole families. Well, we are going to return to Dr. Fry over the course of this ceremony, uh, but Jenny Hill is our correspondent who is at that event, and she's going to bring us up to speed. We're going to connect to her shortly, but these events taking place in the south of Poland, marking the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the concentration and extermination camp by the Soviet Red Army. And, and let's cross over to Jenny Hill. Yes, yeah, 75 years ago, Russian soldiers flung open the gates of Auschwitz and the world recoiled in horror at what was revealed. I'm standing in what they call Auschwitz I. This camp is huge. Um, the Nazis having used this as an extermination camp, a camp for holding prisoners of war, for meeting out cruelty on a, an industrialized and terrible scale, then expanded uh, to create Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, um, which is where, um, at the moment, we're seeing survivors and international delegates gathering um, ahead of this afternoon's commemorations. This 75th anniversary is, I think, very much centered on the survivors, those who made it out of Auschwitz. Um, there are around 200 of them here today. Uh, they are, of course, elderly. Uh, many of them are getting very frail. Some are saying it's probably the last time they'll come back. Um, and to pick up on something that you heard Dr. Fry saying there, um, it is very difficult for them to come back. One lady said to me last night, I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. You know, I still get nightmares when I recall what happened to me here, what I saw, what I endured. Um, so it takes a great deal of bravery and courage and strength for, for these people to, to walk back into this camp. Um, you can see people there gathering in that great tent, which is over what they call the gateway to death um, here at Auschwitz. It's, it was originally the, the sort of gatehouse, if you like, where those train loads of prisoners would first arrive before being taken into the camp. Um, and then selected to go straight to the gas chambers um, or to be sent into the most dreadful conditions where many would starve to death or die from illness um, or be forced into slave labor. So as I was saying, it's very, very difficult for a lot of the survivors sat there, as I say, some of them very frail. But you know, what they all say is that while they do find it difficult to come back, to retrace their steps, to retell those terrible stories, they consider it extremely important to do so. And that is because they don't want the world to forget what happened here all those decades ago. And they believe strongly that by telling their stories, by giving their own personal testament, particularly to younger generations, the world can avoid something like this ever happening again. Um, a few hours ago, some of those survivors um, wrapped against the very winter cold here, uh, gathered just around the corner from where I'm standing actually at what they call the Wall of Death, which is where prisoners were lined up and executed. And they, they stood there and they laid flowers and you could see on those faces the remembrance of almost unimaginable horror. It's very difficult to convey, even to imagine actually, standing here in a beautiful, crisp uh, winter's day to imagine the horrors that were perpetrated or endured uh, within the barbed wire perimeter and concrete walls of this camp. But we know what happened here, and we know that thanks to the testimonies of those survivors who are waiting there very patiently for the commemoration ceremony to begin. Um, just a note on what we're expecting this afternoon. Um, there will be an address by the Polish president, um, Anja Duda. Uh, that will be followed by speeches from four Auschwitz survivors. So we will hear a little bit from them, hear some of their experiences. Um, there'll be music, there'll be prayers. And then in what is expected to be one of the most moving parts of the afternoon, uh, delegates, those who are able, will stand up and they will walk out of that tented area following the railway tracks which actually run straight through where they're sitting and walk along those railway tracks. Now they'll be following in the footsteps of the trains which would have brought prisoners, um, many of them of course Jewish, into the camp. 
The trains didn't always stop where the delegates are currently sitting. They would carry on to what's called the ramp. Um, and when you talk to survivors, they describe in terrible um, terms how they, bewildered, were forced out of those cattle cars. Um, they talk a lot, many of those survivors, about the sudden noise, people shouting, soldiers shouting orders at them, dogs barking, children screaming, their parents crying as they were separated and formed into two lines, one to the left, one to the right. Depending on which line you ended up in, you either ended up in the camp for some, some time, some months, perhaps some years, um, or you were sent, in many cases, straight to those purpose-built gas chambers and almost instant death. Um, so it will be a very dark moment for many of those delegates. Um, it will actually be dark itself. Night would have fallen when they make that walk. And they'll continue past that ramp and onto a monument right at the end of those railway tracks. Um, I believe that around the bottom of monument are messages uh, inscribed in all of the languages spoken by inmates here at the camp. Um, and they will light candles at the base of that monument a light in the darkness, if you like, which is, of course, what today is all about. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, too, that you can see everyone just about settling down there. Uh, you wonder what's going through the heads of some of those survivors, but, and indeed some of the, the world leaders and uh, heads of state gathered there, but I think it's safe to say that many of them are reflecting today upon the fact that we know Jewish communities around the world say that they're experiencing increased levels of anti-Semitism. We know, too, from some some recent research that there is a suggestion that public awareness and knowledge about the Holocaust is starting to diminish and that is a challenge for the people in this room and um, we've heard from the survivors who say well they think the key is to make sure people keep hearing about it that awareness isn't allowed to drop but some of the heads of state some of those government representatives come from countries where they know there is a problem with anti-semitism Germany for example the German president will be there he spoke very moved just a few days ago at another Auschwitz commemoration ceremony about the fact that as a German he'd like to say that his country has learned from the past but that he's unable to do so because of what he described as a current wave of hate. Um, he said it springs from the same evil and it has the same solution and that solution is of course the message which I think every delegate in the room today unites um, in expressing and that is never again. Well, we're going to keep... So there we are, we've got... There we are, the delegates still coming into the room there, taking their places and getting used to, of course, those translation devices. Um, people here speaking all number of languages. Of course, Polish people were in this camp, um, Hungarian people, people from all over Europe. And, of course, the chilling... Um, the, what the chilling truth of, of Auschwitz and indeed other camps like it is that this was the Nazis' final solution. Their plan was to wipe out Europe's Jewish population and to that end they built these camps um, here at Auschwitz. They purpose-built those gas chambers. Um, and the figures when you look at them are not only chilling but but staggering and um, during 1944 for example when the Nazis were really concentrating their focus on Hungarian Jews and rounding them up putting them into those cattle carts and sending them here by rail and um, at one point I think over the space of about a month some 400,000 Hungarian Jews were bought here three quarters of them were sent straight away to those gas chambers and um, one of the difficulties with talking about Auschwitz and, and these other death camps, of course, is trying to find the language um, to explain what really went on here. And that, of course, is why um, those survivors and their testimonies are so important. Um, they really are the only ones who are able to put into words what they went through. And they themselves, of course, struggle to find those words too. Um, one lady told me that she didn't like to talk about it um, and that her husband who actually had liberated 
um, a camp that she'd been in, um, also found it impossible to speak about because, of course, we sometimes forget about the impact on those liberating forces, um, not just Russian forces as, as we saw here, British forces too and other camps who came in and amongst the hundreds of thousands of people who had been in these camps, who'd been sent to the gas chambers, there were really only a thousands of, of survivors um, and those survivors stumbled out of course skeletal in need of extreme medical care and of course great psychological care in the months years and lifetimes ahead And plenty more from Jenny throughout this special coverage. But with me in the studio here is uh, Dr. Helen Fry, who is a World War II historian. And uh, Dr. Fry, throughout uh, what we've just heard from uh, Jenny, you were visibly very moved. Yeah, I mean, I have interviewed Holocaust survivors. I've interviewed those veterans who liberated, some in particular Bergen-Belsen. And um, yeah, I'm deeply moved at connecting with them, but also the horror and the images we're hearing today. You can't fail to be moved even 20, 30 years of research. This is nothing like these human stories. Well, that's the crux of it. I mean, you talk about 20, 30 years of research. Mm. And over those years, you will have met and re-met uh, some of the people that we're seeing here who are looking increasingly mm. friend and have, and have been through so much. And there's talk, of course, that for some of them it might be their last it, yeah. time that they can, can actually visit Auschwitz. And their testimony is so important because the enormity of what happened is incomprehensible. And that's one of the key themes over the last few days. People are still trying, world leaders are still trying to understand the sheer evil. But those human stories of those Holocaust survivors help to relate that enormity to us. Yes, and we were uh, talking also about language, which mm. Jenny just touched on, and just how important language actually is. I mean, it's just so hard to find the right words that do justice to the sheer horror. Mm. Absolutely, and I think we need to allow those testimonies to speak for themselves and, and to be lis to listen. Well, let's uh, dip back into that ceremony. And we can just see the president of Germany, uh, we just saw him walking in with his wife. Um, we don't actually think he'll be speaking today, he's not expected to, but he, he did give a speech at another commemorative event last week, a very moving speech actually, where he talked about how full of shame he is as a German to confront what was done in the name of his country, but at the same time how happy he was that the hands of survivors, as he put it, were stretched out in reconciliation to Germany, um, touching of course on something which I think is a subject of great distress in Germany. Um, some might say that a vein of guilt still runs through that country. Um, Germany in recent years has been very proactive in facing up to its Second World War guilt, but with the arrival of the far-right party AFD in the German parliament, um, there has of late been a little bit more of a debate about how Germany should deal with the atrocities of the past. Um, some very controversially saying that Germany should try to leave its shame behind it. And um, that is something which is um, wholeheartedly rejected by the German president who clearly believes it's very important um, to keep learning the lessons of the past um, and to ensure that this never happens again. So it looks as though the final dignitaries are starting to take their places. We are expecting the President of Poland to give an opening address um, shortly. Rather controversially, of course, he wasn't at a commemorative event in Israel last week, so he'll be speaking now.
Szanowni Państwo, na dzisiejszych obchodach pragnę powitać byłych więźniów obozu oraz ocalałych z zagłady. Witam głowy koronowane, prezydentów, premierów, szefów parlamentów oraz przewodniczących wszystkich delegacji państwowych. Witam przedstawicieli Parlamentu Polskiego i parlamentarzystów z Europy i świata. Witam członków rządów z Polski, Europy i świata. Witam reprezentantów Korpusu Dyplomatycznego. Witam darczyńców, którzy wsparli Fundusz Wieczysty Fundacji Auschwitz-Birkenau Filary Pamięci. So we are trying to bring you an English translation of what is being said as that ceremony gets underway. Of course, what you are seeing is the commemoration event in the south of Poland, marking the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp by the Soviet Red Army. We know that 200 survivors are attending that ceremony, as well as official delegates as well from many countries. And uh, we'll keep bringing you those pictures. But with me here in the studio is uh, Dr. Helen Fry. Uh, Jenny Hill, our correspondent who is there, touched on the issue of shame and the discussions around shame that the Germans might, may well be having. And you have interviewed survivors over many, many decades. Does the issue of forgiveness, I assume it must come up all the time, and what do they say? Yes, we have a lot to learn from those survivors. One of the key things they said to me is we can never forget, but we forgive. Incredible, really. And, and what do they say to you, I mean, about that process? Because it doesn't, uh, that process of forgiveness to ordinary folks seems absolutely unimaginable. I mean, how can you forgive? You certainly can't forget, but how can you forgive when, in some cases, they lost tens of, tens of their family, 40, 50 members of their families? It's um, something about the human spirit, I think, in those dark times that I think we're still trying to comprehend and to try and understand. I'm not sure we can understand. Yes, and we are seeing pictures now of the uh, president of Poland uh, giving his address. So we are waiting for a translation and we'll obviously bring you the key lines that he is saying. But again, staying with that all important subject of forgiveness and the issue of shame, some of, well, so many of these survivors were mere children, four or five years old. And to have a memory like that kind of etched on your brain, it's just unimaginable for us. Mm. I mean, when I think back to when I was four or five, there's very little that I can remember vividly and clearly. And the very fact that here we see these survivors, elderly survivors, many of them looking quite frail, mm. recounting those days, I mean, that's... That's, that's extraordinary. It is, just those vivid memories. It does stay with them, and as uh, we've already heard, in their nightmares and their dreams, you know, it lives with them for the rest of their lives. Uh, Dr. Helen Fry, do stay with us, but let's just uh, listen back in uh, to that ceremony and see those pictures as the president of Poland, Andrzej Duda, gives his speech. Led, driven to mass death. We in Poland know well the truth about what was happening here, as it was recounted by our compatriots who had camp numbers tattooed on their bodies by Germans. It's been 75 years since the end of that monstrous, horrendous and criminal nightmare that was unfolding in this place for nearly five years. It has been three generations since that day, the 27th of January 1945, when a few thousand prisoners, victims of cruelty, exhausted by slave work, hunger and disease, lived to see, finally, the liberation by the soldiers of the Red Army. We have here with us today the last living survivors, people who endured the hell of Auschwitz, 
the last of those who saw the Holocaust with their own eyes, and among them, those who experienced the fate of the Jewish nation, as referred to in the Psalm 44. We are killed all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. We have come here together, members of 61 delegations from all over the world, to commemorate jointly the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We are standing in front of the gate leading to the camp that claimed lives of the largest number of victims and that has become the symbol of the Shoah. We pay tribute to all the six million Jews murdered in this and in the other camps, in the ghettos and places of martyrdom and torture, in the streets of cities and small towns. We stand here before you, honorable survivors, to assume anew in the presence of the witnesses of the Holocaust an obligation. This is an obligation we take thinking of those who perished, of you who have survived, and of the future generations as well. The genocide perpetrated here by the functionaries of the Nazi Third Reich claimed more than a million three hundred thousand human lives. Among them there were Poles, the Roma, Soviet prisoners of war, but first and foremost Jews, whom over one million one hundred thousand were slain here. We are speaking about numbers, but these numbers represent concrete people, their life stories and their suffering. We are speaking about numbers, although we will certainly never get to know the exact figures. Yet we are speaking about numbers, as we are in the factory of death. For numbers make us realize the industrial nature of the crime perpetrated here. The Holocaust, of which Auschwitz is the main locus and the main symbol, constituted an unexampled crime throughout the entire history of humankind. Here, the hatred, chauvinism, nationalism, racism, anti-Semitism assumed the form of a mass and organized methodical murder. At no other time and at no other place was extermination carried out in a similar manner. Jews from Poland, Hungary, France, the Netherlands, Greece, and from other occupied countries all over Europe were brought here in cattle cars. They underwent selection and were deprived of all their belongings. And in their vast majority, they were immediately killed in the gas chambers and burned in the ovens of the crematoria. All of that took but a few hours, quarters, minutes. For years, the factory of death operated at full capacity. Smoke was rising from the chimneys, the transports were rolling. People walked and walked in their thousands to meet their death. It is hard to encompass it all with your mind today. The magnitude of the crime perpetrated in this place is terrifying, but we must not look away from it, and we must never forget it. When the front was approaching to put an end to the crime, the perpetrators attempted to obliterate its traces. They would destroy the buildings and the documents of the genocide. Having slain millions, they also wanted to wipe out the memory of them. 
However, their attempts failed. Witnesses were saved, of whom you, honorable survivors, are the last ones. And this very place has been preserved, the tangible evidence and the symbol of the Holocaust. Hence, we stand here today on the premises of the former German Auschwitz camp. We stand all together and bow our heads before the suffering of the victims of this most horrendous crime in history and before the survivors in the presence of the last witnesses we do assume an obligation for the future in the name of the Republic of Poland who was the first target of Nazi Germany's aggression whose territory was occupied and its nation was subjected to terror who established the largest European underground resistance movement against the Third Reich, whose soldiers fought against Germans on all the fronts of the Second World War from the first to the last day of the war, whose six million citizens died at the hands of Nazis, including three million Jews and who makes an utmost effort to preserve this place, the premises of the Auschwitz camp, as well as all the other places of the Shoah, the former German camps located in our territory. I have the privilege and honor on behalf of the Republic of Poland to renew the obligation that we Poles assumed back then when the Holocaust was being carried out, when our forefathers came to the aid of the murdered Jews, putting their own lives at risk, who were the first ones to reveal to the world the truth about the Shoah and demanded that the world's statesmen respond. The obligation to which we, the contemporary Poles, consistently adhere, also for the sake of the memory of our heroic compatriots, to mention Witold Pilecki and Jan Karski. On behalf of the Republic of Poland, it is my privilege and God to always nurture the memory and guard the truth about what happened here. I wish to invite the distinguished guests gathered here today, representatives of foreign states and nations, as well as international institutions and all people of goodwill from across the world to participate in this endeavor. Let it be our joint commitment, undertaken before the last survivors and witnesses, to keep carrying into the future the message and the warning for the whole mankind that stem from this place. Distorting the history of the Second World War, denying the crimes of genocide and the Holocaust, as well as an instrumental use of Auschwitz to attain any given goal is tantamount to desecration of the memory of the victims whose ashes are scattered here. The truth about the Holocaust must not die. The memory of Auschwitz must last so that such extermination is never repeated again. Once again, thank you honorable survivors for your testimony and for your presence here today may the memory of all the victims of Auschwitz live eternally may the memory of the victims of the Holocaust live eternally
Teraz wysłuchajmy świadków. Let us listen to witnesses. May I ask a former Auschwitz inmate, Batrzewa Dagan, to take the floor. Trudno. Witam was wszystkich serdecznym shalom. Everybody, welcome. Let me say shalom from Israel. Trudno mi ukryć mojego moje uczucia. It's difficult for me to hide my feelings. I'm standing here in front of you. I'm not sure whether it is real or whether I'm dreaming that I am here with you 75 years on after what happened here, this great suffering that took place here. My number was for 5,554. Schutzhaft Link. In German, is an inmate under protection. Here, then, in that other reality that used to unfold here, this word did not mean actually protection. Care for another human being did not belong there. Human dignity did not belong there either. Quite the opposite. Even if you open a dictionary, you will not find a phrase to de that would describe how human dignity was trampled. So this word inmate and under protection Schutzhaftsling what was it for? so much despise in there in this devilish world where human dignity was treated as if it were dirt there was no way of finding shelter anywhere I am Heftling All those people that were in a lager would be surprised, but I did not have a striped uniform because there were too few. And I was given a Russian soldier uniform. I had to wear it on my body directly. And my legs were wrapped in a praying shawl that shawl that is used by Jews and I had those Dutch wooden shoes mind you they were uneven what else did they do to me first they tattooed a number of on my arm and it is just as visible today as it was back then it was very well tattooed, well tattooed indeed. So, I couldn't recognize myself. Those blocks, they had windows very high. I raised my hands and that is when I recognized myself to be myself. The worst thing that I went through at the very beginning, well, it is hard to say actually what was more painful to me, whether it was 
the process of tattooing a number on my arm or something else. I believe, though, that was what was the most hurtful for me was the loss of her, because the her gave me a sense of belonging to womanhood, and they were smooth. This her was my own. And this criminal hand touched my hair. This crown of mine was taken away from me. And I was turned into this pitiful, sad creature. My hand touched a naked skull. And I could see the contour of my face. I couldn't recognize myself. Is it really me? Where is my crown? And in the mirror, I recognized myself, or rather it was not a mirror, it was a glass, a window, and it was really me. Her braids were used for different purposes. Who could think back then that they would be used as a resourced resource for mattresses. However, what they were really after was depriving me of my own human face and her would grow back as nature commanded and there was this dream within my heart it was still alive maybe tomorrow will come one day and tomorrow did come indeed memories remained though and let me tell you something else I worked in four commandos in the lager the first one I would collect herbs that were somewhat poisonous and my hands would bleed 12 hours per day. As we sit here, we remember that we would be woken up at 4 a.m. because I was collecting, remember I was collecting nettle. And actually this nettle was used to make soup This woman, Aufzeir, everybody knows who she was, what this word means. She was really cruel. She had a dog, she had a stick, and she would beat us up. What she wanted was this basket of grass to be not only full but also packed. And I spent many years in this, or rather many months in this commando. And then there was the second one, Kartoffel Commando. I was there rather briefly. There was this Lagerstrasse, the street there. I met my cousin. And she was a doctor's wife. And she worked at what we call a revier chimneys smoking on the one hand and hospitals on the other but hospitals well that's just a name and I caught all the diseases you could think of and I still remember the German names for all those diseases and there was this itching all the time I was the first best candidate to be sent to chimneys now, Dr. Mengele, when he inspected us, we would have to stand in rows naked and we would be driven to death. But I said I wouldn't go and I hid under a bed, under the cover. And somehow I saved myself in this way. And there was another commando later.
So I had to kill lies and I learned then that there are two types of those creatures. The first type of lies live on your heads and the second type lives in your clothes. So I would kill lies with my, th with my fingers. This would be the first job that I had to do in the morning. I had been through a terrible disease, diseases actually, and Canada was the next commando that I got in. It was the inmates themselves who came up with this name. So I worked in Canada. I'm sure there are people here from Hungary. I would hold Hungarian clothes in my hands. At first, I would cry, but then I had to get used to that because that was to become my job. There were all those huge piles of clothes from different corners of the world. And there I saw a photograph of my teachers from Lutz. In 1944, the ghetto in Lutz was liquidated. So, this was my meeting. So, how do you live in such a place? Jewish schools had been closed down. So, I decided that I had to learn something. And there were all those languages that surrounded me. Fifteen, maybe more people who work here will know better. So I would hear all those languages that surround me and I thought I need to learn something. Well, I will learn a language. So I found this Belgian lady and she became my teacher. I had no pencil, I had no paper, I had nothing to help me. and. On I went with my learning. So when I left Auschwitz-Birkenau, I spoke fluent French. There was another thing that I learned here. Yeah. Poems and melodies that were created by inmates. Krystyna Żewulska was one of them. and her poem become, became our prayer. It's a very long poem. I'm not going to recite it here. I still know it by heart, like I did all those years ago. So, this poem, Kristina Zvolska's poem, Marching Out Into the Field, was known to me in the camp is marching out of the gate, became our prayer here. The description of our suffering was an expression of each one of us. However, not every prisoner was able to describe the painful reality in such a manner. The main source of strength was the crazy lust of revenge, for so much agony and so many complaints, bayonets into the brain and daggers to the neck. The words of revolt wandered from mouth to mouth and only changed slightly depending on the memory and personal association of female prisoners. The thought of revenge became a source of strength, allowing to endure the long days and nights of inhumane suffering. I continue learning all the time. Now, what helped me to survive 
was that I myself decided to do something for myself. I decided to choose what I want rather than following orders. However, I w did not get to be liberated on the 27th because we could hear the Russian army approaching, there were cannons firing. So basically, I did not get to experience this liberation. I was driven out and made to march. Could I have some water, please? Just a little bit, not much. So that's what I thought back then. So it was a dream, a dream about freedom, and the heart beat to the pace of revenge, revenge for all that suffering because we had to wait in a queue to death. And various countries in the world did nothing. And I still have this feeling today, where was everybody? Where was the world who could see that, who could hear that, and yet did nothing to save all those thousands? So, what now with the world? It was my dream to learn. Apologies. Let me just say it from the bottom of my heart rather than reading out from a piece of paper. So I was meant to liquidate Auschwitz-Birkenau. What was my last job in Canada? Mind you, Canada was a name that Zonderkommando, the inmates, came up with. Canada is a rich country, isn't it? And in Canada, there were all these items brought with them by, by, by all those inmates from all these countries. This is where they were collected. And I saw it all. Now, the upside to working in Canada was that you could eat things. We would eat whatever was brought by people. Because people coming here had been told that they were being taken to work. They had been asked to take some food with them. So all this food was being brought to Canada. And we were sickly and thin, we would eat that. Can you eat such things? Well, back then, anything was possible.
there was one more thing that helped us to live in this hell, friendship. You could find a group of people who would help one another. Sure, the Holocaust are not only about the terrible things, and what about the righteous among the nations that helped? There are many other things, subjects that can be told to children. I had the struggle, namely, I would like the subject to be introduced at an earlier stage. Why so? In various countries where children are 13, 15 years old, it's already too late. Because at this point they are undergoing certain physiological changes. And what they think about is themselves and their position in a social group. So a question. Is it necessary to teach that subject? Is it possible? I have an answer to those questions. Yes, it is very much necessary and it is by all means possible. Why is it truly necessary? We live in the world of the media. And we have those phones, iPhones, whatever its name is. People play with those objects, even toddlers. So children grow up playing with those iPhones, and they know more than we would like them to know. For that reason, this subject, this topic needs to be taught as early as possible. Well, in Israel, it's different because we have those sounds. Children ask why we, they hear those sounds. However, in other countries, they don't have that. I'm sure there are teachers here. I'm addressing the teachers at this point. First, you need to learn what children know and what is the source of their knowledge. You need to learn what they would like to know. I've been to various places. I've been to Argentina, to Canada. I've been to America many a time. And I spent three years in England. I wanted to learn, so the first thing that I it was I learned I picked up Hebrew very fast I went to this teaching college also I worked as a kindergarten teacher children would approach me about why I had this thing written well for 40 years I've been looking for an answer. Mind you, in museum you have four books in Polish. They have been translated from Hebrew. Well, for the most part. They are meant to be used in schools. What else should I say? Maybe that I would like to cry because only with tears I can tell you about this past. I can see so many people here. You are a source of comfort to us. I hope you will all try to preserve the memory of this place and other sites where people, innocent people died. People from various nations. I hope that you will make sure you'll bear this responsibility 
so that this terrible thing will never happen again. Thank you so very much. Szanowni Państwo, o zabranie... Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask a former Auschwitz inmate, Elsa Baker, to take the floor. It is, a, it is a great privilege to st stand here today at this great event, this historic event, when uh, so many people are, I mean, having, having just listened to that lady's speech, that really upset me, it upset me, despite the fact that I was also uh, in Auschwitz as an eight-year-old girl. But uh, I would like to say that it is an it honored for me to, to be here among so many people who have suffered so greatly, perhaps even much more so than I, and I, 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 it is, uh, no, it, I'm upset, you, you probably can feel that, that I'm very upset while listening to that lady there, yes, yes, it is, you know, I would like, I would like to thank the Polish people for having preserved this former camp here and made, made it into so, such a world-renowned um, memorial, Holocaust memorial, which is, it is today, and where people can come, especially people who, who are in that category I was in, in, in Auschwitz for, which is Sinti and Roma, which as I know I lived in England by nearly 60 years, and I know not many people know that Sinti and Roma have greatly suffered in Nazi, under the Nazis, similar to, to the suffering of Jewish people. And that, and now, some Asha, Asha will c continue talking now because what I'm saying, I'm blind, I can't look at, at notes, so what I'm saying comes from the heart and she will continue now with my speech, she will read it, but I have written it, I have written it, yes.
Mrs. Baker has asked me to deliver the rest of her speech because she is severely sight impaired and she cannot read it herself. In 1944, when I was just an 80-year-old girl, I was taken from my home in Hamburg and deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp. Since my biological mother was a Sinti, the Nazis considered me a gypsy and imprisoned me together with thousands of other Sinti and Roma in the so-called gypsy camp. Almost 90% of a total of 23,000 inmates at the gypsy camp were murdered. Horrible as it was, the extermination camp Auschwitz was just one side of the genocide committed against Sinti and Roma. All over Nazi-occupied Europe, Sinti and Roma were murdered in camps or shot by execu ex execution squads. Today we know that around 500,000 Sinti and Roma became victims of a campaign of systematic extermination. In Auschwitz, I witnessed mass murder. There were long queues of people in front of the mass murder facilities like the gas, chamber and, gas chambers and crematoria, which were not far from our camp's electrified fences. And then the ear-splitting screams started. Orders to stay inside our barracks with doors locked were disobeyed and we saw a large area of open fire blazing. I, as an eight-year-old girl, overheard, overheard adult conversation like, they must have run out of gas and they are burning people alive. You might be interested to know that only six months ago, I was here at the Auschwitz Memorial commemorating an event that took place there on the 2nd of August 1944. Almost 4,300 men, women and children from our camp, after one of those Nazi selection processes, were condemned to be murdered that very night. I was among those the Nazis selected to be put into cattle trains and to be deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Even today, it's extremely difficult for me to come back to the place of the former concentration camp Auschwitz. I experienced firsthand the effect of anti-gypsism, anti-Semitism and racism. I myself survived Auschwitz to shell luck and the selfless act of some of my fellow inmates. For decades, after 1945, the genocide committed against Sinti and Roma was largely ignored. It took a private initiative by Vincent Rose, one of the early activists of the Sinti and Roma civil rights movement, to erect a modest memorial on the side of the former camp to commemorate the Sinti and Roma murdered at Auschwitz. Today, it is the setting for memorial services like the one I attended last August. Those that were murdered and those that survived the camps must never be forgotten. Hopefully, this memorial site and museum will remain here for many years to come as a warning to people not to let racism and insane ideologies backed by wrong sciences like, for, for example, eugenic, gain power again. May I just say one thing that is very near to me. In times like this, when minorities have to feel vulnerable again, I can only hope that everyone would stand up for democracy and human rights. Thank you.
Szanowni Państwo, o zabranie głosu. My dear comrades of the horrors in the camp, distinguished guests, distinguished visitors to this place, friends, I am but one of those who are still alive, few who were here in this place almost until the last moment before the liberation. On the 18th of January, my so-called evacuation started, evacuation from this camp, from Auschwitz, and after six and a half days, it ended. It turned out to be the death march for more than every other co-inmates, my fellow inmates. We walked together as a column of 600 people. According to all probability, I will not live to see another jubilee here. This is how it goes. So please forgive me that there will be some emotions in what I'm going to say. Now, this is what I would like to say, to tell primarily to my daughter to my granddaughter who is here in this room, and I would like to thank her for that. To my grandson as well. But I'm mostly after those who are the peers of my daughter and my grandchildren. The younger generations, especially the youngest, those who are even younger than they are. When the World War broke out. I was but a teenager. In the First World War, my father was a soldier. And he was shot into his lungs. And that kept repeating. That was a drama for our family. And it went on and on. My mother hailed from the Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian borderland. Armies went forth and back. They pillaged, raped, burnt, burned villages, not to leave anything for those who were coming after them. So you could say that I had first-hand experience of war. Nonetheless, even though it was only 20, 25 years apart. Those times seemed so distant, like those Polish 19th century uprisings, like the French Revolution. And that was only 20 years away. So when today I meet young people, I perfectly well realize that after 75, if not 80 years, people get somewhat bored. They find war, Shah, Holocaust somewhat of a boring subject, just like genocide. And I actually understand them. That is why I promise to you, the young, 
that I'm not telling you about my suffering. I'm not telling you about what I experienced, my two death marches, how I finished the war weighing 32 kilo, really on the verge of life, utterly exhausted. I'm not telling the things that were worst, the worst, the tragedy of the farewells, of parting with the near and dear, when after the selection you see and you sense their fate. No, I'm not telling you about that. What I would like to pass to my daughter, to my grandchildren and to their generations, I would like to tell you something about you yourselves. I see we have among us the President of Austria, Mr. Alexander van der Bellen. Do you remember, Mr. President, when you hosted me and the management of the International Auschwitz Committee, we discussed those days, you used such a phrase Auschwitz is nicht von Himmel gefallen. Auschwitz did not fall down from the skies. You could say that's an obvious thing, absolutely obvious. It did not. This may even seem a hackneyed phrase, quite commonplace perhaps, yet this is a profound shortcut in our thinking and it helps to understand certain things. Let's use our imagination and our thoughts to get to the early 1930s to Berlin. We find ourselves in the center of Berlin Barische Viertel, the Bavarian district, is the name of the district. It's just three stops away from the Tiergarten, the zoo. There is a station of the metro there. There is Barischef Park. And one day, in those early 1930s, You can read an inscription on the benches. Jews must not sit on these benches. You could say it's unpleasant, it's not fair, it's not right. But after all, there are so many benches around. You can sit somewhere else. Of course you can. In that district, and that was a district that was inhabited by intellectuals, by the intelligentsia, German, of Jewish origin. Albert Einstein used to live there. Nelly Sachs, the Nobel Prize winner, a politician and industrialist, Walter Rathenau, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs. There was a swimming pool and over its door, an inscription read, Jews are forbidden to enter. You could say, well, pleasant this is not, but there are so many places in Berlin where you can take a bath or swim, so many lakes, canals, it's nearly like Venice. At the same time, you can read somewhere else, Jews must not belong to German singing associations. So what? All right. They want to sing. They want to make music. Let them just meet somewhere else. They will do their singing. All right. What comes up later is an order, really, more an, of an order than of an inscription. Non-Aryan children must not play with Aryan children. 
with the German children. All right, they'll play on their own. And then you read We only sell bread and food to Jews after 5 p.m. Right, less choice. This makes your life harder. But after all, after 5 p.m. you can still do your shopping. Now I warn you, I warn you, I'm getting used to a thought. That thought that someone may be excluded becomes mediated into our lives. The thought that somebody can be stigmatized, that someone may be alienated. And that's how it is done, step by step, slowly. People begin to see that this is something normal, both victims and the perpetrators, the witnesses, those whom we in English call bystanders, those who see it become familiar and they become acquainted with that thought, familiar with the idea that the minority that produced Einstein, Nelly Sachs, Henry Heine, Mendelssohn's, and many novelists, that it is different, that it can be pushed beyond the margin of the society, that they are different people, that they are alien people, that they are the people that carry germs, that cause pandemics. And this now is a horror that's dangerous. This is where what may happen soon takes its origin. And let me tell you, if you consider that, and if we remember the words of Mr. President, power, power that at that time ran sly policy. For example, they met all the uh, claims of workers. The 1st of May was never celebrated. All right, they gave you a day that was free from work. They introduced Kraftirchheute, so a special holiday for workers. They could also fight unemployment. They knew how to play on the dignity of a nation. Germans move up from the shame of the Treaty of Versailles have your pride back. And that government also saw that people were slowly engulfed by this lack of sensitivity. They ceased to react to evil. And that was the moment when that government could speed up the process of evil. What came later was something that developed immediately. Jews could not get jobs, they could not emigrate, and then quickly Jews would be sent to ghettos, to Kaunas, to Riga, to my ghetto, the Litzmannstadt, the Zwuch ghetto. Most people from there were later sent to Kulmhof, Helmna on the Ner, where they were murdered in lorries with exhaust gases. And the rest will make their way to Auschwitz, where in a very modern world, way and manner, they were murdered with Zyklon B in all those modern gas chambers. And here you see how 
the words of the president come true. Auschwitz did not fall suddenly from the skies. It was pittering, pattering in all those tiny steps. It was approaching until what happened here behind me did happen. My daughter, my granddaughter, peers of my daughter, peers of my granddaughter, you do not have to know the name of Primo Levi. Primo Levi was one of the most famous inmates of this camp. Primo Levi once used that phrase this happened, which means that it may happen again, which means that it may happen anywhere, anywhere in this world. May I share one personal memory with you? In 1965, I went for a scholarship to the US, to America, and that was the peak, the acme of that battle for human rights, for civil rights, for the Afro-Americans. It was my honor to participate in a march with uh, Martin Luther King from Selma to Montgomery. And then people who learned that I had been an inmate of Auschwitz would ask me, how do you think? It must have been only in Germany, or do you think it could happen somewhere else? And then I told them, it can also happen in your country, in this land, when the civil rights are broken, when people do not obey the laws of minorities, when you do away with the rights of minorities. If you banned law as it was done in Selma, this may come to be. What to do? There is only one way out, only you, if you are capable of defending your constitution, defending your laws and your rights, your democratic order, which is based on the protection of minority rights, only then will you be able to conquer all that evil. My dear, here in Europe, most of us hail from the tradition called Judeo-Christian. Both the believers but also the non-believers assume as their civilizational canon the Ten Commandments. My friend, my closest friend, the president of the International Auschwitz Committee, Roman Kent, who spoke here five years ago during the previous jubilee. He couldn't arrive today. He couldn't fly in today. He's frail. He's been sick lately. But he invented the 11th commandment. The 11th commandment that is an experience of the Shah, of the Holocaust, which is the experience of that horrible time of disdain. And that 11th is be not indifferent. Thou shall not be indifferent. And 
And this is what I would like to tell you. My daughter, my grandchildren, I'd like to tell it to the peers of my daughter, my grandchildren, wherever they live, be it Poland, be it Israel, be it America, be it Western Europe, the Eastern Europe, yes, precisely, the Eastern Europe. It is very important here. Do not be indifferent when you see lies, historical lies. Do not be indifferent Do not be indifferent when you see that the past is stretched to fit the current political needs. Do not be indifferent when any minority is discriminated because the essence of democracy is that majority governs but democracy hinges on the rights of minorities being protected, and they have to be protected. At the same time, do not be indifferent when any power or government infringes all the social compacts that are there, that are already extant, and keep the commandments 11th, thou shall not be indifferent because if you are, you won't even notice when you, when your as will suddenly see an Auschwitz falling down, dropping down from the skies straight on them. Szanowni Państwo, Ladies and o zabranie głosu proszę byłego may I ask a former Auschwitz inmate Stanisław Zalewski to take the floor. Well, if you're just joining us, you're watching BBC World News. You are watching the commemorations on this, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz camp. And we've been hearing from survivors over the last little while. Let's rejoin events and listen back in. <laughs> but the solemn commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of concentrations like at Auschwitz. I address my words of respect to all those who were spurred by the fate from the industrial operations of the German Nazi machine of genocide in Auschwitz and other concentration and extermination camps. A drastic but true way of putting it and I'm referring to the innumerable amounts of human hair, glasses, prosthesis, shoes, clothing and other items used daily by children, women and men of different nationalities and religions. So, the ashes of those people were scattered by the winds of history, by their immortal souls, remained in this 
zone invisible to humans and they came here in great numbers and they are circulating here among us if we open our hearts we will hear their cries their moans and complaints to God in a place such as this words fail and the heart cries out to God in this dreadful silence Lord why did you remain silent? In this silence we bow our heads before the countless people who suffered and were murdered here. Yet this silence is a loud cry for forgiveness and reconciliation, a prayer to the living God to prevent it from ever happening again. How many questions come to mind here? One in particular keeps coming up. Where was God in those days? Why was he silent? How could he allow so much destruction, this triumph of evil? These were the words of Pope Benedict XVI during his visit to Auschwitz-Birkenau in 2006, a pope from Germany, he went on to say, we cannot fathom the mystery of God. We see only fragments and we are lost when we want to become judges of God in history. These words of the Pope became a point of reference for me. One must not rummage through the conscience of people who had experienced a time when people deliberately forgot about another person's right to live. From here onwards, I will be referring to my own path, this path meant on this path I saw the Gaspar headquarters in Warsaw and Paviak, a prison in Warsaw, the auschwitz birkenau concentration and extermination camp, the Mauthausen, Gusen 1 and Gusen 2 concentration camps. I was brought to this place in October 1943. I was tagged with a number that was tattooed on the inside of my left forearm. And I received other numbers in Mauthausen and Cousin 1, Cousin 2. The number from Auschwitz. I've had it for 77 years and it is still legible. It is legible and it is a living witness to unforgettable tragic events. I remember in Auschwitz-Birkenau. I remember naked women being driven in trucks from the barracks to a gas chamber. I can hear them screaming. I can hear it in my subconscious when I remember those events. I recall people nicely dressed wearing the Star of David armbands, walking around with no signs of fear. A large group of these people led by just one SS officer and he led them in the direction of the crematorium. However, only me and a few fellow inmates and next to me knew about it. I mean Gusen 1 and Gusen 2. In Gusen 1 and Gusen 2, I witnessed death penalties for observing the rules of one religion. I saw prisoners, sick prisoners, killed in the camp hospital by a functionary prisoner. I saw the suicide of prisoners who threw themselves on this electrified barbed wire fence. On the first day of freedom, I witnessed drastic extrajudicial executions performed by prisoners and functionary prisoners and it was done because of the 
statistic nature. It originated and manifested itself in camp conditions, and these are just a few select examples. To live a normal, creative life, I try not to think about the events that took place in the camp, and I found my own way of doing that. So I took my memories and I put them in this airtight box. I tied a rope to it and I threw it into a river. Occasionally I take it out and I took it for today's event, but once I've used those, I put them back into this box and put them back into the water. However, once the echoes of the ceremony, ceremony sees. Some memories overcome my defenses. They penetrate my memory, trigger reflections, and some questions that remain unanswered. When I say pater noster, pray, I recite a verse. Give us our daily bread today, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the question is, what is forgiveness of sins? Is it forgetting the damage that was inflicted? Or maybe it's about refraining from imposing punishment. Maybe it is about abandoning the right for compensation. Can we forgive those who had this description got mit uns on the buckles of military belts and killed people with premeditation? Let me emphasize that. It was premeditated. Because war is an art of killing. Whoever kills more wins. War breeds violence on both sides. And the stronger will impose a law, and it can be quite cruel. And war blurs the lines between good and evil. To avoid that, there must be reconciliation between nations. Yet reconciliation without historical truth and forgiveness will only be but a bridge without a railing between the edges of a precipice. You can cross it, but not without fear. Therefore, it is a moral obligation of all those present here to act, act in such a way that nothing like that ever happens again. Under these inhumane conditions that prevailed in Auschwitz and other concentration camps, prisoners, inmates formed various underground organizations. Their primary goal was that of protecting human life and human dignity. Speaking in, human, in modern terms, I was a beneficiary of such an activity and that made it possible for me to survive temporary breakdowns, to overcome this feeling of hopelessness, both in Auschwitz and other camps. Such actions unleash new energy, strengthen certain bonds and stimulate a person to act, to overcome one's sense of powerlessness, to overcome this loss of hope. I'll give you two examples. A Franciscan father, Maximilian Kolbe, voluntarily gave up his life for another person, a father of a, of a large family. Cavalry Captain Witold Pilecki voluntarily allowed himself to be imprisoned in Kale, Auschwitz. He organized, or rather, let me phrase that, he fled from Auschwitz to tell a, the truth about what was happening in Auschwitz-Birkenau. He participated in an uprising in Warsaw and he was killed by the communist authorities in Poland. So two people, two different people, both incredibly courageous, and they showed heroism and dedication in a place created to exterminate people, and their sacrifice was not in vain. 
The Witold Pilecki Institute of Solidarity and Martyrdom was established in Poland in 2017. One of the goals of this institute is to commemorate people of different nationalities, victims of German Nazi crimes. And the Maximilian Kolbe Werk Association established in Germany has been operating since 1973. It is meant to reach agreement and reconciliation and provide assistance in various forms to former inmates of concentration camps and ghettos, regardless of their religion, their views, and their beliefs. On the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, the association awarded all former inmates of concentration camps a commemorative medal. The document attached to the medal reads, quote, you have survived the atrocities and terror prevailing in the camps, but afterwards your lives have been very difficult, and yet in this time you have given great reasons for reconciliation. So on the medal you can find a rose that symbolizes your message, that of reconciliation. We believe that your exemplary behavior will also affect others and will be something to follow, especially to those nations that remain adamant and intransigent. You suffered in camps and ghettos and Nazi prisons. Your life had been difficult after the liberation, but all of that was not in vain. Of this we are truly and deeply convinced. That's how it should be, but it is not. These days, in many regions of the world, people overcome by fanaticism of various kinds, political, racial and religious, they commit acts of violence to achieve their own personal goals. These acts of violence claim thousands of lives, and that bears the hallmarks of genocide. Has history turned a full circle? I mean a circle propelled and driven by people who do not respect other people's dignity? Dear participants of this commemoration, I am an optimist and I believe in people. So far in my life, excluding my stay in prisons and concentration camps, I have received more good things than bad things from others. In qualifying human deeds as good or bad, I'm supported by a beautiful woman who has a blindfold on her eyes. In her, her left hand she carries balance and in her right hand a sharp sword. I will ask this lady to stay with me on the 26th of January. Yesterday the President of the Republic of Poland, together with his spouse, presented to former inmates of concentration and extermination camp in Osterburgnau medals commemorating the 75th anniversary of the liberation. The medal was founded by the Osterburgnau State Museum. Now, there is this message attached to it, and there is this fact that it is the highest Polish authorities present this medal. And that means that basically it is an unwritten document that documents this tragic history of the Polish nation and other nations during World War II. I deeply believe that this event will be used to act 
for the benefit of all the remaining witnesses of history. O zabranie głosu proszę przedstawiciela filarów pamięci. Największy reprezentative of the pillars of memory, the greatest private donors in the fund for authenticism of Auschwitz-Birkenau, Mr. Roland Lauda. Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, Rabbis, Clergy, Honored Guests, and most importantly, the survivors of Auschwitz-Birkenau who are with us today. This is about you, the survivors. And I cannot begin to tell you how grateful I am that you are here, and in some cases, here with your children and grandchildren. Five years ago, 
when I stood here in front of these painful gates and I admitted that I'm not a survivor, but I am so grateful for the survivors who are here today. I'm not a liberator, although I salute the courage of the veterans who saved us all. I am here simply as a Jew, and like Jews everywhere, And like Jews everywhere, this place, this terrible place called Auschwitz, has sadly become an inseparable part of all of us. Auschwitz is like a terrible scar from a terrible trauma. It never goes away, and the pain never stops. I've always wondered if I'd have been born in Hungary where my grandparents were from, instead of New York in February 1944, would I have lived? The answer is no. I've been one of the 438,000 Hungarian Jews gassed by the Nazis in 1944, right here in Auschwitz. I can assure you, almost all Jews have pondered this question. 75 years ago today, when Soviet troops entered these gates, they had no idea what lay behind them. And since that day, the entire world has struggled with what they found inside. We have all wondered how an advanced country that gave the world great literature and art, science achievement, could sing to an anger a meanness, a depravity like Auschwitz. But let me be clear, while Germany and Austria cause created and carry out this shattering evil, practically every other European country helped the Nazis gather up their Jewish citizens. Too many people in too many countries made Auschwitz happen. When European Jews begged the world for a safe harbor, somewhere to go, the entire world turned its back on them. Even my own country, the beacon of freedom, turned out its light on the Jewish people when they needed it most. The United States organized a conference in Evian, France in July 1938 to discuss the Jewish refugee problem. There were a lot of lovely speeches, but America did not let any additional Jewish refugees in, and every other country in attendance followed its lead. There were 32 countries, and none of them, except for the tiny Dominican Republic, wanted any more Jews. Hitler saw this. Four months later came Kristallnacht, and again, there was no world reaction. Hitler tested the world, and at every step, he saw the truth. The world did not care. That's when he knew he could build this factory of death. Evian led to Auschwitz. Kristallnacht left, led to Auschwitz. World anti-Semitism led to Auschwitz. Frankly, thankfully, there were some people throughout Europe who had a moral decency and acted differently Ordinary people who risked their lives and their families' lives to save other human beings. Sometimes people they didn't even know. In Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, you will see 27,362 names on what we call 
the righteous among nations. These Gentiles who risked everything to save Jewish lives, we have not forgotten. These honorable men and women, who we, we will never, never, never forget. God bless them. Five years ago, at the 70th anniversary, I was very concerned about the shocking rise of anti-Semitism here in Europe. Today, you all know the attacks on Jews, the killings, the vicious slanders have only grown worse, and they have spread to my own country. Seventy-five years ago, when the world finally saw the pictures of the gas chambers here, and the piles of bodies. Nobody in their right mind wanted to be associated with the Nazis. But now, I see something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. The open and brazen spread of anti-Jewish hatred throughout the world once again. In 2020, we hear the same lies the Nazis used so effectively in their propaganda. They said, Jews have too much power. Jews control the economy and the media. Jews control governments. Jews control everything. We hear this madness online, in the media, and even within democratic governments. We will never eradicate anti-Semitism. It's a deadly virus that's been with us for over 2,000 years, but we cannot look the other way and pretend that it doesn't happen. That's what people did throughout the 1930s, and that is what led to Auschwitz. There were 50 countries, there are 50 countries represented here today. I know each and every one of you is as disgusted by anti-Semitism as I am. You also know that you alone cannot stop this, but all of you can certainly speak out forcefully against it. We can't rewrite history, but we can be much more forceful today. All of us must remember those brave moral people who tried to stop this, as world, all world leaders, all politicians must lead in this effort. Words are not enough. Political speeches are not enough. Laws must be passed, severe, tough, real laws that will put these hate mongers away in prison for a long time. <laughs> Children must be educated to know where the hatreds of Jews lead. Those are all important, but there's another vital way for world leaders today to fight this age-old hatred. I've asked all countries to stop casting votes in favor of the UN's constant and shameful fixation on Israel. Exactly three years, three months, and three weeks after the liberation of Auschwitz, the Jewish people realized their 2,000-year-old dream and founded the Jewish State of Israel. If for no other reason than the fact that not a single country on earth would take in Jewish refugees when they begged for their lives, that is why the Jewish people need Israel. Seventy-five years ago, the Jewish people left Auschwitz. They fled Europe. They were forced out of every country in the Middle East. And instead of living in refugee camps and turning to terror, they built a vibrant democracy in a place where democracy does not exist. They have created miracle after miracle while having to defend their existence every single day. No other country on earth has had to do this. 
And for this, the UN, some journalists, even some government leaders constantly condemn it. But it's even worse. Israel has been singled out over and over again with the same lies that we heard about the Jewish people for centuries. Over the last seven years alone, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted 202 resolutions condemning countries around the world. Of those 202 resolutions, Israel was condemned 163 times, and the rest of the world only 39. 163 against Israel, 39 for the rest of the world. We all know these votes are absurd. The UN ignores true evil dictatorships that kill millions of their own people. And it's clear as day that this kind of obsessive anti-Zionism is nothing but anti-Semitism. I realize that here at Auschwitz, you are surrounded by numbers. 75 years, 1933, 1938, 6 million. But there's one number that still shocks us while breaking our hearts at the same time. 1,500,000, that's the number of Jewish children one and a half million who died in the Holocaust. It's so painful, we try not to think about it. It just hurts too much. Had these one and a half million children been allowed to live like others' children around the world, they would now be in their 70s and 80s. They would have been educated. They would have married. They would have had children of their own. Such a loss. But something else as well. What could these one and a half million children have created for us all? What symphonies, what great literature, what technology, what medical breakthroughs do we lose from these lost souls? There is one more part of the Auschwitz story that no one ever talks about. When the survivors were liberated from this Nazi nightmare, they never sought revenge. They lost their mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. In too many cases, they lost their wives and their children. And in spite of this, not one German was killed in retribution by a Jew. Not one. Think about that for a moment. After everything that happened to them, these Jewish survivors walked out of these gates and went on to build new lives, raise new families, work hard and create. Some of some grandchildren here today. And it is shameful that 75 years later, they now see that their grandchildren face the same hatred, the same hatred again. This is a shame and must never be tolerated. In the end, I'm afraid that all these numbers, one and a half million children, six million Jews, these numbers are just hard, too hard to comprehend. So let me leave you with one last story. It comes from the Eichmann trial in 1961, where witness after witness described their experience here at Auschwitz. But there was one man who stood out because he spoke in an unusually non-emotional tone. He described arriving on this platform here, right here, with his wife and little daughter. They were herded out of the cattle cars, and they stood in line for the selection. Right over there 
a doctor would decide who would go to the right to work and who would go to the left for extermination. This man was separated from his wife and daughter at that moment, and they were pushed away. On the witness stand, he said, there were so many people, I didn't know how I could keep my eye on them. But his little girl wore a red coat, and he was able to watch the little red coat until it got smaller and smaller, and then he couldn't see it anymore. The young Israeli prosecutor, Gabriel Bach, was standing at his chair when the man finished like this. He stood there silently. Finally, the judge asked Bach to continue. But he stood there. Again, the judge told Bach to continue. And again, he just stood there silently. Years later, Bach explained that as fate would have it, he and his wife had just brought their three-year-old daughter, a little red coat. And Gabriel Bach said, to this day, if he goes to a sports stadium or a restaurant or just waiting down the street in Jerusalem and he sees a girl in a little red coat, his throat will tense and he cannot speak. Frankly, after this story, whenever I see a red coat and a little girl, I think the same thing. This is the legacy of Auschwitz, and it will never go away. To every Jewish person and non-Jewish person's audience who leaves here at these gates today, we must do this. When we hear something that is anti-Semitic, when we hear someone talk about Israel unjustly, when Jews are attacked in our streets, do not be silent. Do not be indifferent. Do not just do this for the Jewish people around the world. Do this for your children. Do this for your grandchildren. But also do this for the little girl who, in the red coat, whose ashes lay 300 meters away, along with one other million tortured souls. They are watching us today, and I cry out in one shattering chorus. Do not be silent. Do not be complacent. Do not let this ever happen again to any people. Thank you. Szanowni Państwo, ladies and gentlemen, zapraszamy do obejrzenia filmu pod tytułem We would like to show you a video. Objects. They were just like us. And this video has been prepared for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the former German Nazi concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau.
Szanowni Państwo, oddaję głos Thank you, panu gentlemen. I would like to give the floor to the steward of Auschwitz Birkenau Memorial, Mr. Piotr Cywiński. It has been 75 years since the liberation of concentration camps in Auschwitz. We have among us today over 200 people who experienced this hell, hell that we cannot even imagine. Thank you so very much. What you have been saying through all those 75 years, what you said back in the camp was never again. Not for yourselves, but for us. Our children and grandchildren. We built this post-war world and our experience on your experience so we do owe you something we all do the world was meant to be different the united nations was to be the guarantor of peace crimes against humanity were to be always prosecuted international cooperation and interdependence were intended to deter conflicts Ecumenism was supposed to bring people of faith together. Today, however, from almost every corner of the world, we can see the revival of old specters. Anti-Semitism, racism and xenophobia are on the increase. In darkness, the resurgence of populism and demagogy strengthen ideologies of contempt and hatred. And we are becoming increasingly indifferent, confined within ourselves, a pathetic passive. We do not see, and we cannot see, we do not talk, we do not want to talk. The majority was silenced when the Syrians drowned. In silence, in silence we turned our backs on the Congolese. We practically did not utter a word when the Rohingya were murdered two years ago. And today, with silence, we conceal the tragic fate of the Uyghurs. Silence after the Holocaust is inhuman and never again will it be human. Besides, the Holocaust, our silence today, is our greatest disaster, our self-dehumanization. Yes, that is correct, self-dehumanization. The righteous among the nations did not click on likes. They were not known for writing protest songs nor did they sign online petitions. They performed boundless good in dramatic conditions, rescuing concrete individuals. But that is the only reason that why they save their face and their dignity. And how do we, with all our culture and memory, compare ourselves to them today. Worse than forgetting is a memory that does not bring any moral concern within us. It is then that the never again is lost. 75 years after Auschwitz, it is in fact in memory that we must search for sources for our responsibility today. Meanwhile, in our memories, we often only seek short-lived emotions without consequence, without 
negation such memory loses its significance. How can one say never again while looking into the eyes of the Jews attacked on, attacked on the streets? to the Roma being humiliated, people all over the world, persecuted minorities, refugees, the starving, the murdered, the hundreds of thousands of people incarcerated in various camps. Salman Gradovsky, who was murdered here in Birkenau, was right when he wrote shortly before the Zunderkommando revolt, we have a dark premonition because we know we also know and feel what has become of our world. Where and why did we squander our basic fundamental values? Where is our own individual responsibility, the responsibility of each and every single one of us? So, when will Auschwitz become a reality that has been overcome and liberated? In the very essence of this cry, never again, the liberation of Auschwitz also continues today, right here, right now, every day.
Szanowni Państwo, zapraszam do wspólnego... Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I invite you to a prayer. Let's pray together for those murdered in Auschwitz. Those who feel they can do it standing, please let's stand up. Proszę pana Dawida Wiśnie. May I now ask Mr. David Wiśnie, a survivor of Auschwitz, to pray El Male Rahamim and Kaddish. Tzoror 
את נשמתם. בגן עדן תהא מנוחתם. אדוני הוא נחלתם. ויענוכו בשלום על משכבם. ונאמר אמן. We continue with the Kaddish. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash, Shemei Rabbah. Please join me, those who can. Bialma di brach yirutei v'yam lich malchutei. B'chayechon v'yamechon v'chayei d'chol b'yit Yisrael. B'agala v'izman kari v'yimru. Amen. יהי שמי רבה מברך תלה מול עולמי עולמיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר דרומם ויתנשא. ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשה בריך הוא. לאלה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה. תושבחתה ונחמתה. דם איראן בעלמא ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיא וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ועל כל העולם ונאמר אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. Proszę Jego Ekscelencję, arcybiskupa Salvatore Penacchio, o odmówienie modlitwy wieczny odpoczynek, oracjo pro fidelibus defunctis w języku oracjo pro fidelibus defunctis in Latin. <coughs> Oremus, animabus sumus domine, famulorum famulorum pe tuarum misericordiam concede perpetuam ut eis proficiat in eternum quod in te speraverunt et crediterum requiem eternam dona es domine et lux perpetua lucet eis requiescant in pace Amen Proszę Jego Ekscelencję Piotra Gregera, Piotr Gregor, Bishop of the Catholic Church, now pray Wieczny Odpoczynek. Proszę Jego Ekscelencję Piotra Gregera, Bishop of the Catholic Church, now pray Wieczny Odpoczynek. Oratorio Profidil was defunct is in Polish. Wieczny Odpoczynek radzi im dać Panie, a światłość wiekuista niechaj im świeci, niech odpoczywają w pokoju wiecznym. Wieczny odpoczynek racz im dać, Panie, a światłość wiekuista niechaj im świeci, niech odpoczywają w pokoju wiecznym. Wieczny odpoczynek racz im dać, Panie, a światłość wiekuista niechaj im świeci, niech odpoczywają w pokoju wiecznym. Amen. Proszę wielebnego księdza Mikołaja Dziewiatowskiego z polskiego 
of Polish Orthocephalic Orthodox Church. Could you please say the prayer, God of spirits and all the flesh in Old Church Slavonic? Господу помолимся, Господи помилуй, Боже духов и всякой плоти, смерть по праве дьяволу праздневый живот в миру твоему даровавей, сам Господи покой душу собших раб твоих, всех зде погибших, вместе светло, вместе злачни, вместе покойня. От нюды же от беже болезнь, печали и воздыхание, Всякое согрешение, соденное или словом, или делом, или помышлением, Яко благи человеку любец Бог прости, Яко нес человек и жив будет и не согрешит, Ты бы един так мог без греха, Правда твоя правда во веки, и слово Твое истина, яко Ты си воскресенье и живот и покой у собших раб Твоих, всех зде погибших, Христе Боже наш, и Тебе славу воссылаем, с обезначальным Твоим Отцем и Пресвятым и Благим, и животворящим Твоим Духом, Ныне и пресно, и во веки веку. Proszę Jego Ekscelencję Adriana Korczago, biskupa diecezji cieszyńskiej Kościoła Ewangelickiego. Wszechmogący Boże, przed Twoim obliczem wspominamy dziś tych, którzy na tym szczególnym miejscu kaźni bestialsko byli mordowani. Ufamy, że w Tobie, naszym Bogu, znaleźli wybawienie z cierpienia, doświadczyli zwycięstwa życia nad śmiercią, i obdarowani zostali wiecznością. Wspomóż nas, abyśmy czerpiąc naukę z przeszłości przezwyciężali w sobie wszelką niechęć do drugiego człowieka. Motywuj nas do życia w pokoju, zgodzie i miłości. Amen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I now ask everyone to take their seats. In a moment, the four speakers, survivors of the Shah and the presidents of the state delegations will be asked to get ready to go to the monument to the victims. The people who will remain here in the tent in front of the gate of death will be able to watch the ceremony. Once again, I'm requesting that all of you, apart from the survivors and the heads of state delegations, may stay. Now an homage will be paid to those murdered in Auschwitz. Let the lights that we are going to leave there be a sign of commemorating and paying homage to all the victims. After the homage ceremony, the delegations will return to the tent. Ladies and gentlemen, we have listened to the following pieces of music. Well, we just heard prayers from all faiths bringing
to a close this first part of commemorations marking the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Before that, the audience utterly transfixed by Zetsewa Dagen, Elsa Baker, Marianne Tursky and Stanislaw Zalewski, four of those who survived Auschwitz, giving first-hand accounts. There was the address to from Ronald Lauder who said, do not be silent, do not be complacent, do not let this happen again. And then we heard from the director of the Auschwitz Memorial talking about Auschwitz, a hell we cannot imagine. Well, let's go there, let's talk to Jenny Hill, our correspondent, monitoring all these extraordinary events of the day. And Jenny, it was a ceremony of just the most extraordinary power. Yes, it has been a profoundly moving day here. Um, as you say, we heard those speakers hold the audience entranced as some of them described the ghosts of Auschwitz and the responsibility to the memory of more than a million people who lost their lives here in such unspeakable circumstances. Um, a responsibility too, we heard, to the present day and to future generations um, to ensure that the world never allows something like this to happen again. Um, we are now coming to perhaps the most disquieting part of today's commemorations. Um, those delegates that you might be able to, to see now standing up um, and the survivors who were able to join them will now leave the hall um, where the, the vast part of the commemorations have been taking place and they will follow the railway tracks out of that hall, out of that tent, along the old track where 75 years ago, 80 years ago, those cattle carts packed with terrified people were sent to be received by SS guards shouting orders, barking dogs alongside them, hurrying them into two lines, sending them off, some of them, to an uncertain and unpleasant life here in the camp as slave labourers, the others to a painful and terrifying death in the gas chambers. The delegates will walk along that long path, no doubt thinking of those victims, thinking too perhaps and reflecting on what we've heard from the speakers today, the need to ensure that anti-Semitism never rises to this extent again, thinking too perhaps about the consequences and implications of uh, difficult issues around racism, immigration, all of those political issues that are discussed so easily these days. And they'll walk along those tracks carrying candles and eventually they will reach a monument right at the end of the track of Auschwitz. Um, a large stone monument, inscriptions around the bottom, uh, written incidentally in the languages of the many languages which were spoken amongst prisoners here in the camp. And there they will lay those candles down uh, to lighten, if you will, the darkness of Auschwitz with what many here hope will be the light of the hope of responsibility to tomorrow. You can just see them walking through the darkness now. It's very cold here. Everyone's wrapped up warm. Very, very crisp, cool air carrying their candles in that solemn procession, thinking as they walk calmly, freely, able to leave once they've placed their candles, thinking, of course, of those hundreds of thousands of people who had no choice, who were brought here under duress, separated violently, suddenly, forcibly from their loved ones and sent off to either death or an uncertain and very dangerous, very painful future. Uh, among the people who will be either watching them from back in the hall or perhaps even joining them if they're physically able to will be some of those 200 survivors who've been here today for whom it's been a very difficult journey, of course. Um, many of them say they don't want to come back to this place. So imagine the courage and the strength that it must take to retrace their, their steps and then to retell those very painful, difficult stories. They're doing it, of course, because they say that to do so is the only way to ensure that future generations understand what happened here and make sure it never happens again. And Jenny, that walk so that we see the, the pictures of, as you have been describing, it's about 
a kilometre from that main event we were just uh, listening to. And an awareness there, isn't there, that this could be the last major anniversary where so many of the survivors are fit well enough to actually take part. Yes, that's right. Um, some of the survivors have made it clear that they won't be coming back again. Um, I spoke to one lady yesterday who said after the, her last visit to Auschwitz, she was ill for, for weeks um, and she knows that this, this time uh, will take a huge physical toll on her. You have to remember, of course, that so many of the people who survived the cruelties of Auschwitz um, suffered long-lasting physical and of course psychological effects as a result um, and that, that stays with them to this day. So it's not an easy journey to make um, and I think the organisers of this year's uh, anniversary commemorations were particularly keen to make sure that um, those 200 survivors were very much at the heart of the ceremonies today because they know it's very unlikely they'll get this many of them together again and able to, to speak to tell their stories so strongly. Jenny, for now, thanks very much as we stay with these pictures. Uh, let me also bring in and talk to the Second World War historian, Dr. Thank you. Helen Fry. As we continue to see these live pictures from the second part of this commemoration as they head to this Birkenhau uh, memorial, as they walk the final stages of that one kilometre. Helen, as you watch these pictures, you've been sitting here listening to the last few hours with me. And Jenny touched upon it. Uh, for the survivors, it's an astonishing thing, an astonishing journey for them to make, uh, to go back, the difficulties, the agonies of the, the memories and the stories they are telling. Yeah, it's been an absolutely extraordinary day, very moving and very solemn. And for them, you know, incredible courage, as we've been covering today, to be able to do that. Because physically, you know, they're in their 90s, most of them. And as we've said, uh, probably their last visit to Auschwitz. And the power, that's what struck me listening, the power of those first-hand accounts. When you hear it from the mouths of people that actually lived through it, who survived it. It is difficult to exaggerate uh, the impact that actually has. Yeah, because of course we're commemorating the Holocaust as a whole, where two thirds of Europe's Jews actually were murdered. You know, how we can't comprehend that. But these individual stories, of course, you know, we can relate to the human stories. And so it brings that absolute horror on a personal level so that we can perhaps begin to understand Yes, because when you try to imagine the numbers we talk about, it's unfathomable. And it's interesting actually listening to different charities through the course of today, uh, almost directing people to find out about one person, to mm. follow one person's journey uh, as a way of really humanizing what is so still unimaginable. Absolutely. And what we mustn't forget is that behind today will be decades of work by the Holocaust survivors, those who have already passed and those who are here still today, going into schools and actually making sure that people understand, and particularly the next generation, understand what they went through and the lessons of the Holocaust. And of course, one of the big themes today is whether we really have learned the lessons that are happening again, the anti-Semitism, within the lifetime of these survivors. And that is interesting, and I'll come back to that point, but it, it's fascinating the psychology when you listen to people talk about those decades since Auschwitz. So many of the survivors saying, for a while, they refuse to talk about it. And then, as we've got uh, closer to now, seeing the things you were alluding mm. to, anti-Semitism, they are absolutely spurred on by what they're seeing to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed a number of Holocaust survivors who couldn't tell their children, but now with their grandchildren, they realise that this is the last chance to speak. And if you think that at the very end of the war, they were so traumatised that the walls of silence went up, partly to protect themselves. I just pause simply to look at uh, the astonishing pictures uh, coming from this event, and uh, it has been like this 
through the last hours since this started, what, uh, about three hours ago. A, a beautifully choreographed commemoration, the power of those speakers, the power of the images, and of course, they were speaking in a tent erected right at the gates of Auschwitz, the gates where those survivors that spoke talked about the trains arriving and talked about, Helen, just the astonishing random nature of how many people, of, of how they actually survived. People being sent to the left, people being sent to the mm -hmm. right, and that determined whether they lived or died. Absolutely. <clears throat> and so many of those survivors talked about the fact that they did not know from day to day whether they would survive the next day. So living with that, with the horror of what they were seeing and hearing, but also the trauma of not knowing if they would live another day. And when we were watching a little earlier, you were talking to me about the importance of education in terms of ensuring that younger generations actually know mm. what happened here. A and we heard that too from Ronald Lauder in that address saying, do not be silent, do not be complacent, uh, being absolutely essential that the message of today that so many of those people who are gathered here is that they want to ensure that actually people understand, mm. really understand what happened. And it is about education and within the Jewish community, the Jewish figures I speak with, there is a feeling with that horrendous rise in anti-Semitism, has Holocaust education failed? And that's a very important question going forwards and we owe that to the survivors to, to look at has it failed and of course for younger generation, they often seem dislocated from a wider understanding of history. And so I think history is going to be crucial going forwards, history and memory. And it was interesting listening to that address because Ronald Lauder saying that uh, it was brazen now, it was open in terms of the spread of uh, anti-Semitism, the same lies he was saying in 2020 mm. as they were back in the 40s. Well, what we mustn't forget is that Western Europe has a history, 2,000 years, of Christian anti-Semitism, and that has largely been dealt with, but that's now gone into like anti-Semitism, mixed up with uh, political um, anti-Semitism as well, and so it's a very dangerous situation. Adam, thanks very much. Uh, I know you're going to stay with me for the next few minutes as we continue to look at these live pictures. But uh, for the moment, we will return to Auschwitz in the next few moments. But uh, for the moment, we're going to come away uh, just for a couple of minutes to try to squeeze in another couple of the stories uh, making the headlines today. So we'll be back in Auschwitz uh, for the continuation of that in a moment.